Good evening and welcome to Doctors on Call. I'm Dr. Sandy Stover, faculty member at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth campus, and I'm your host for our program tonight on lower GI problems. We would be happy to take your questions on colon cancer, colitis, diarrhea, constipation, or any other lower GI questions you might have. The success of this program depends on the questions you, as viewers, send us. Please call in or email your questions and we'll do our best to address them. The telephone numbers and email address can be found at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists this evening include Dr. John Reich, a gastroenterologist with Essentia Health, and Dr. Ken Ripp, a family medicine physician with the Radier Family Health Clinic in Cloquet. Our medical students answering phones tonight are Morgan Kessler of St. Michael, Minnesota, Alexis Knudsen from Laverne, Minnesota, and Matthew Moritz from Sox Center, Minnesota. And now, on to tonight's pr uh, program on lower GI problems. Well, um, welcome to both of you for, uh, for uh, tonight. And um, we also have some images that we're going to be using just to kind of get people a little uh, aware of how to visualize some of the body's digestive tract and lower GI problems that can occur. And Dr. Reich, I was hoping you could kind of take a look at this graphic and um, kind of outline what, we're, what area of the body we're talking about tonight. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, so generally we think of the upper GI tract as beginning with the mouth, connecting to a swallowing tube called the esophagus, and then into the stomach and the first part of the small intestine, which is called the duodenum or duodenum. And then there's about 15 feet of small intestine that the food and nutrients travel through as they're processed to get to the colon. And the colon uh, starts down on the right side by the appendix, and, and uh, that's where the small intestine empties into the large intestine or the colon. And so the lower GI tract generally we consider as sort of the end of the small intestine and then that large intestine called the colon, which uh, has the segments you can see in the picture there, ascending colon and then transverse comes across the middle and the descending on the left and then the sigmoid kind of an S-shaped uh, snaky part of the colon called the sigmoid and ends in the rectum, which then empties into the anus and that's where feces go out. And so tonight we're going to be talking a bit more about the lower colon, which is, uh, you can see on the graphic on the right. Um, one of the things I think that, as a family physician, I had a lot of questions on over the years, of course, is colon cancer. That's an, er an, an area that's important for people to think about prevention as well as, as screening and then, of course, management. Can, um, Dr. Rip, can I ask you a little bit about some of the uh, kinds of screening things that are available now for colon cancer screening? Uh, there are several ways to screen for colon cancer. The most important thing is that everyone, when they get to be older, needs to start their screening program. And there are several different ones. Colonoscopy is the most effective because you get a complete visualization of the colon. You can see, ev hopefully see everything with a good prep. And if there is a problem, sometimes it can be addressed right then and there. Meaning if there's a small polyp, it could be removed or something that needs to get biopsied. You could do it right then and, and start your path to treatment if needed. There also are stool tests that can be done. There's one that you can do yearly and it's very cheap and easy to do. And then there is a, a genetic marker test that's, you know, that we're trying to figure out still, but it's every three years. It's a little more expensive and sometimes it, 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 one of the problems we have is you end up with a lot of positive tests, but then you end up with a colonoscopy anyways. So that one is maybe not as cost effective. The, the screening used to start at 50, but now they've backed it down to 45 to begin colon cancer screening. So. Uh, and uh, Dr. Reich, I know that there's certainly concerns if there's colon cancer in the family. So if you had someone who had colon cancer in your family, what level of risk might that be for you? Uh, genetics certainly increase the risk of colon cancer and particularly in first degree relatives, meaning mother, father, siblings, or children of, of whoever you know, has the cancer. But um, generally our, our current recommendations, if there's no obvious uh, genetic um, if there's no obvious genetic mutations in the family, but there's a family member with colon cancer, is that we start at age 40, which, uh, as Dr. Ripp said, it used to be 50, and now we're sort of leaning toward 45 at age 40. But uh, if the family member, the first degree family member, had colon cancer under age, uh, we, we, or uh, 10 years younger, than the first degree family member. So if your first degree family member had colon cancer at age 48, then you would start at 38. Mm -hmm. And what are some signs that you might, um, say you didn't have a family history of colon cancer, but you might have some symptoms to be concerned about. What might you, what make you think about colon cancer, Dr. Ripp? Well, 
one thing about colon cancer screening is we want to get to people long before they have symptoms because if they have symptoms they are often in a little bit deeper trouble but if there's any change in your stool habit if there's any change in the caliber of the stool obviously any bleeding any unexplained weight loss change in it, it, it change in appetite any of those can be abdominal bloating those can be some of the red flags that we would definitely want to investigate quickly mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, in terms of that investigation we kind of talked about the screening um, I'm kind of interested too in prevention, of course. We all are interested in prevention. What kind of uh, recommendations that do you give Dr. Reich for uh, patients to consider doing to help reduce their risk for colon cancer? Yeah, I, I get that question a lot. And uh, genetics, obviously, you know, can't, can't necessarily beat genetics, but there are some lifestyle modifications that we think may be helpful in prevention of decreasing inflammation in the bowel which is uh, probably, you know, certainly one of the risk factors for developing colon cancer and polyps and mutations in the large intestine and certain things that uh, people can modify in their lifestyle. So uh, smoking, excess alcohol use. Uh, we think that high intake of processed foods, very particularly processed red meats, probably has some factor in, in inflammation. So eating more whole foods, less processed foods. Uh, exercise probably has some protective benefit as well. And so, you know, it's kind of generic to say a healthy lifestyle, but uh, I think that's the case for a lot of illnesses that, that humans, you know, are, are, are deal with. And so um, those are some of the things that I counsel patients on. But, you know, just to add with, to what Dr. Ripp says, generally colon cancer is not symptomatic until it's very advanced. And so uh, it's the uh, third deadliest cancer in the United States. And so screening is very actually cost effective. And, you know, we just encourage everyone to get screened in one way or another. Um, and I think I'm going to direct one more question to you about aspirin. That's been something that's come up over the years about uh, using aspirin to help prevent if you might be at slightly higher risk. What do you think about that? Uh, aspirin has shown to have some protective effects. Uh, it doesn't seem to be as protect, so protective that we say you should use it if you don't have other reasons to use it because aspirin actually can cause uh, things like stomach ulcers and things like this too. And so there is potential downside to aspirin use. And so if folks don't need it for something like heart condition, we don't generally just prescribe it for, to prevent colon cancer. There are some special cases where maybe there's a genetic condition in the family where, where someone is very, very high risk for colon cancer, then uh, that might be a different story. But in the general population, we, even though aspirin probably has some preventative effect, we don't generally uh, Think about doing that. prescribe it for that. Well, and, and just to kind of to um, one more thought about uh, doing in screening, how often should you screen like with colon, uh, colonoscopy, Dr. Rip? What's it, the recommendation? If you're low risk, meaning no family history, you're just a healthy person, a colonoscopy every 10 years, as long as it's normal. If there's a strong family history of colon cancer, one of your first degree relatives, then a lot of times they'll shorten that interval down to every five. And then if you've had a colonoscopy and you're low risk, but they found a polyp, depending upon the size of the polyp, and that might once again shorten that interval down. So, and then the, the stool testing, is once a year for the, just the regular one and then every three years if you're doing the genetic, the Cologuard. Okay, that sounds, sounds good. Um, one of the comments that you made, Dr. Reich, was uh, as we all know that vegetables are good for us, uh, eating a high uh, plant-based diet, uh, Mediterranean diet, there's lots of things that we know that are helpful. But we have a caller who is concerned and, and curious about uh, vegetables creating excess gas. Uh, there are some vegetables that do tend to be a little bit more um, likely to do that. Dr. Reich, would you like to comment on, on ways that we can help balance that? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good question. And, you know, so it, it's very fascinating how different people's digestive systems handle different foods. And um, we think that probably some of the reason that people get bloated and gassy with certain vegetables is they probably just have a little bit of an imbalance in maybe some of the healthy bacteria or different bacteria in their intestine. And, you know, that discussion could be hours and hours. It's just very cutting edge things that are going on with studying the bacteria in the, in the intestine. But um, there are certain vegetables uh, for a lot of people who, who tend to be more gas forming, broccoli, cauliflower, uh, beans tend to be uh, culprits from that. And, you know, generally you say, 
small amounts, sometimes cooking them, steaming, uh, softening vegetables can be a little bit easier on the system too. Um, but uh, if, it be, if it's a real big problem where people are just trying to eat any sort of vegetable and getting very bloated and yassy and things, that's something that I actually see people quite a bit for. There's different conditions, uh, irritable bowel syndrome, bacterial overgrowth syndrome, other things that we start to think about when people really have uh, significant bloating and things. And, and there are some more serious things too that, that can be going on inside that we think about. And so. You know, while vegetables are good, sometimes the bacteria that individual people have in their system doesn't handle that, uh, those certain vegetables all that well. Oh, which is a, there's a question about the biome that I think is interesting. Um, and Dr. Rip, I know uh, people come in with questions about biome, how they can help their right. own biome to stay more healthy. Do you have recommendations that you talk over with people? Uh, yes. So. The, the, bi the biome that lives inside of you is actually determined very early on, within the first few weeks of life, the bacteria that are going to live in your gut are already predetermined. Um, so it is hard to shift it. Now, some people do, can get a benefit from uh, using a probiotic, and that is sort of an experiment for each individual. And we sort of say, if you try this and this really helps you, fine. But some people try the probiotics and get no benefit. Maintaining a healthy uh, biome in your gut can be a few things. If uh, certain antacids, if you're on antacids chronically, that can shift the biome a little bit because you're you're not allowing the you know you have no sometimes produce no acid in your stomach and that can sometimes cause a shift. And then if your diet is uh, you know depending upon what you're putting in, sometimes can prom promote growth of certain bacteria that might make you more gassy or crampy. So a lot of times it is a little bit of a, a experimentation on the patient side to figure out what works and what doesn't. So. And Dr. Wake, what are your thoughts about probiotics and adding something like that? Oh, so probiotics, <laughs> you know, the, the, the experts have just gone back and forth so much on probiotics. And, and I could, like a lot of topics, I could probably talk for very, way too long on that. But uh, Dr. Rip, I totally agree in that some people get great benefit from probiotics and some people get none. And it's a little bit of a different concept to understand. There's so many different options out there with so many different strains of bacteria. And when you look at big studies that combine lots of other studies, they say, yeah, probiotics look to have some benefit in people with irritable bowel. But when you look at kind of individual ones, there's no one that seems to be just right. And the number of bacteria in your, particularly your colon, there's more bacteria than there are stars in the sky. It's one of the most diverse ecosystems and all uh, all of animal kingdom is the human colon and so um, you know taking a pill with some bacteria when you have so many already there it, it's difficult we don't understand why it works for some and, and it doesn't work for others but in, I usually say to patients it's safe you know in general probiotics are safe and um, if it helps you, then that's wonderful. Maybe you are replacing, uh, or you know, maybe your balance of bacteria, you're fertilizing a little bit with better bacteria. Um, I have got another question that was called in, and I'm gonna ask you, Dr. Rip. Uh, this uh, patient called in and said that I have occasional fecal leakage after normal bowel movement, and could, there, could you have a recommendation what the cause might be? It a little depends upon the age and the sex of the person. Mm -hmm. If it's a female and they've had a delivery, a lot of times there can be trauma to the rectal muscles that control that. So that's a possibility and hopefully that heals over time. Sometimes people can have a nerve injury that can make that sphincter just not be as tight anymore. Just as if you, you know, have a bad pain down your leg, that nerve can get weak. Some people can have a genetic condition or trauma to the area or a surgery. And then sometimes it's just like every other part of your body. Some people just, that muscle weakens over time. So if that is something that you definitely want to bring up to your doctor, talk about, sometimes there can be an external something pushing on it that's making that happen. So that's a good thing to get in at least talk. There are medications that can help a little bit with it. And sometimes you can do some biofeedback to try and strengthen that muscle. So there are specific therapists who work on trying to teach people how to strengthen those pelvic floor muscles. Um, I have another question about diverticulitis, uh, and diverticulitis is, I think, something that is relatively common. I, I'll ask you, Dr. Reich, um, what, what can you help us describe a little bit? We have one graphic about sort of what a diverticular outpouching looks like. Can you kind of describe how, how and what diverticulitis is? Yeah. So, so diverticulosis is a term we use when people have these pouches in their large intestine 
that uh, generally are minding their own business. And it's actually very common to have diverticulosis. We think about half of folks in their 50s, 60% in their 60s, 70% in their 70s have diverticulosis. And, and we think that probably some of this is Western diet, genetics, uh, but over years of probably having a little increased pressure in the colon, uh, leads to these little areas of weak spots in the colon where the blood vessels enter and exit to deliver the good sort of blood and oxygen to your colon. It's just a very weak spot and over years it kind of slowly pouches out and becomes this little bubble almost in there. And, and honestly for most people they, they like I say mind their own business but because so many people have these occasionally folks can get uh, a blockage in these things that can cause inflammation if they don't empty well and stretch and what we call diverticulitis where you can get an infection in these little pockets. Uh, and, and it's quite common just because so many people have diverticulosis. And what kind of symptoms might someone have if, it, if you went past the diverticulosis and went into the more inflammatory diverticulitis? What would that feel like? The textbook symptoms are to have pain sort of on the lower left side of your abdomen and uh, usually it doesn't change your bowels all that much as far as you know your bowel movement. Sometimes people uh, maybe have a little bit looser stool. Sometimes people get constipated, but usually it's pain down on that left side and sometimes people can get fevers associated with it as well. Is there anything people can do to kind of help reduce the chance of developing the diverticuli? Well, I think there aren't the one thing that, that I've read recently that may be a little protective against diverticulitis and symptoms of these diverticula is eating fiber, particularly um, whole grain fibers, bean fibers, things like that, soluble fibers as they say. Um, there used to be a recommendation to avoid things like popcorn and berries and seeds and things of that nature. The, the, the research doesn't really bear that out. Now, I have had patients come and tell me, oh, every time I eat popcorn, I get pain down here. And I say, well, I think I have a solution for that, mm -hmm. you know. And so certainly if there are foods that cause trouble, we generally say to avoid that. But, but usually a healthy diet with good healthy fiber is the way to go. Well, and another kind of an outpouching that a lot of people experience in the, in the uh, lower colon is hemorrhoids. And uh, Dr. Rip, I'm going to uh, ask you to help um, give some ideas about first pr kind of prevention and then thinking about what might you do if you did have some outpouching right at the, at the rectum itself. That, uh, so, describe the hemorrhoids so, a little so bit. So we'll too. start off with just what a hemorrhoid yeah. is. So, you know, there's a few places in the body where the circulation, the arteries and veins sort of meet and you can get a pooling of blood. And so a hemorrhoid is a vein that's sort of blown up like a balloon, a lot like a diverticuli. And they can be above a certain line called internal or external ones. The external ones tend to be itchy and irritated and they're very painful. The internal ones tend to not be painful, but you'll feel a lump or a bump down there. Anytime you have a lump or bump anywhere, it's time to go get a check to make sure it's not something more because you don't want to say, oh, it's just a hemorrhoid and have it be unfortunately an early colon cancer. So, but usually hemorrhoids develop, sometimes it's genetic, sometimes after a lot of straining. So most women in labor will have hemorrhoids just from the straining. And then if people do a lot of heavy lifting, a lot of sitting can be bad. Or if you're sitting, especially like when you're sitting on the toilet, just puts a lot of pressure on those veins and they can swell. So it's a good idea not to spend a long time on the toilet because that promotes those, the formation of those hemorrhoids. The internal hemorrhoids can be banded if they're bothersome. The external ones, a lot of times they will either resolve on their own with some topical stuff you can buy over the counter or there's some medicines that we have that might help heal them faster. And sometimes they need to be, if they're very painful and acute, will be drained right in the office. And, and if, they're all, if it's recurrent or bothersome, sometimes they actually end up going to the operating room and having them more thoroughly removed. And in terms of thinking about helping to reduce the, the likelihood of them forming, um, is there dietary things you'd recommend? Uh, once again, you don't want it. You want to keep, if you're eating well, exercising regularly, hopefully your bowel movements are reasonably soft, not hard. But if you're straining to have a stool, that is really going to promote you having a, a hemorrhoid because you are now just forcing all that blood down there, and, and that's one of the things that can make it worse. But any heavy lifting, if you're doing a lot of heavy lifting, that can definitely promote it too. We've had a couple of uh, questions together that's a, a very good point we didn't quite get to in talking about colon cancer. Um, we have a, a question from a 79-year-old and an 84-year-old about the, the thought about how, 
how, at what point do we not screen for colon cancer in terms of, of age? Dr. Egg. The, the general recommendations are that after age 75, you individualize screening for colon cancer. And so generally, we recommend colon cancer screening to folks until they're about 75. Um, of course, there are other conditions that, you know, you would say if you have other life-limiting conditions, um, you probably don't need to. But after age 75, we weigh what is someone's risk of colon cancer. For example, have they had polyps before? Have they had first-degree relatives with colon cancer? Uh, along with how healthy is the person, you know? if um, and, and it sounds sometimes a little caustic to say, but uh, if you're over 75, should you be getting colon cancer screening? And we say, well, do you think you have, you know, maybe 10 good years in you? Because if you do, then it's probably reasonable to do colon cancer screening. And the reason I say that is because the time it takes, we think, from a small precancerous mutation or polyp in the colon to grow large enough and become troublesome and turn into colon cancer is probably between 10 and 15 years. And so, um, we, and then at, at age 85, we generally just say, yeah, you don't need to drink all this laxative and come and get probed again. It's, you know, you've had a good run. But. <laughs> Uh, and there's a question that to, to some extent too about the PrEP that came up. Um, that it's, the PrEP for, for a colon cancer screening for a colonoscopy can be kind of difficult to do for some people. Dr. Ripp, do you have recommendations for the colon um, PrEP that might be easier for people when they're going into their... There's, there's uh, the old PrEP used to be a huge gallon jug of seawater basically that was just brutal and now the newer preps are less volume to drink they are you still need to eva clearly evacuate your 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 colon and and for uh, especially as you get older that can be you know challenging because it is a draining procedure no pun intended but you know, if you take a 78 year old and they do the prep at home and they stand up and pass out and hit their head or break their hip boy, was that the right thing to do. So as you get older, the prep becomes more difficult. And sometimes for people who are on the edge, we'll actually observe them in the hospital and do the prep. We don't do that much anymore, but we used to do that for people who are too high risk or someone you know, who has, you know, has a you know, red flag and we have to look at them. Sometimes it's safer to do it under observation. We've had a question too, a good question about some of the inflammatory bowel disease that's out there. And the, this question is about Crohn's disease. Can you talk a little bit about how you might know if you had Crohn's disease, if there was a family history particularly? Uh, Crohn's disease is very tricky. So Crohn's disease, the other common inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, and uh, the, the, the pr prevalence of these is, is increasing uh, all the time in, in, in our country. And we're not exactly sure why, but that's kind of a different discussion. But what kind of symptoms might people have with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis? So uh, for Crohn's particularly, abdominal pain, diarrhea, um, blood in your stool. Um, for Crohn's, it can act, it can be located anywhere between your mouth to your anus. And so there's all kinds of different symptoms people can present with, with Crohn's disease, but unintentional weight loss. Sometimes even people can get skin rashes along with bowel symptoms from Crohn's disease. And so, you know, if you have a family history of Crohn's disease and you're having concerning digestive issues, uh, you definitely should talk to your doctor about it. And sometimes it, you know, it is going to require us to do things like scans or endoscopies, colonoscopy, things like that to, to confirm or not the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, it, when you have the kind of symptoms you described, um, you talked about them being more longer term, but, but um, if someone has symptoms for on just a couple of weeks, would that be considered a concerning amount of, of loose stool? Or um, what other causes could there be for loose stool? Uh, the definition that we kind of go by as far as change in bowel symptoms, particularly diarrhea, is, is if you have symptoms for more than a month. You know, if you've, if you've been tested for infection, let's say, and that's not there, and you have these symptoms for more than a month, it usually requires or, or at least merits some further evaluation. Two weeks of change in stools can be, oh, there's so many different things that can cause that, uh, a mild viral infection, a medication change, even just a diet change or eating something that didn't agree with you. And so, you know, a couple weeks usually is unless you're very, very sick, but a couple of weeks generally we say, let's give it a little more time. And then I just had a good question about uh, some of the proton pump inhibitors, which are medications to lower acid, but in particular one pantoprazole, is that 
is taking that for a long time a concern for someone? Dr. Rip? Well, yeah, they're, they are, they're great medicine and they are almost too great of a medicine because they suppress your stomach acid and now we're in the upper GI tract so much that it can affect you if you're on it for prolonged periods of time. It can delay or decrease absorption of certain vitamins and minerals. If there's no acid there, some bacteria can get growing in your stomach and that can cause some problems. It does raise your risk of pneumonia and does have a negative impact on your bone density over time, probably because of lack of absorption of other things. So ideally, if you can use the proton pump inhibitor, that class of medicine, and then transition them to a little milder medicine over time, that is what is preferred. Now, some patients just cannot live without them. You, you, you have a conversation about the risk, and because of the, we always do this balance of risk and benefit, and if the benefit is outweighs that small risk, then you need to stay on it. That so sounds good, thank you so much. I know there are some over-the-counter ones, is that the same, is that true for some of the, um, by, by over-the-counter I mean some of the other uh, acid blockers, like being on Tums or something long-term, is that a problem at all, Dr. Um, yeah, you know, Tums, Tums can cause some constipation and some rebound acid, and so if you're taking Tums every day, we, we need to okay. evaluate. Okay, to be a little bit careful. So <laughs> yeah. the bottom yeah. line is if things aren't working with your yeah. bottom, you should right. go in. Yeah. Um, we have some helpful websites to share if you want to learn more about colon cancer and other colon diseases. You can do that by visiting www.cancer.org and gi.org backslash patients for more information. I want to thank our panelists, Dr. John Reich and Dr. Ken Rip, and our medical student phone volunteers, Morgan Kessler, Alexis Knutson, and Matthew Moritz. Please join Ryan Harden next week for a program on diabetes when his panelists will be Dr. Louise Franco and Dr. David Hutchinson. Thanks for watching and good night. <music>